So our speaker tonight is Professor Catherine Zurich. She's a senior scientist at the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. Uh, she undertook her graduate studies at the University of Washington. She received a PhD uh, in particle physics, theoretical particle physics, in 2006. After her PhD, she moved to a postdoctoral position at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And in 2008, she became a David Tran Fellow at the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory. <coughs> in 2009, she joined the faculty at the University of Michigan and then moved to the Lawrence Berkeley Lab in 2014. And in 2016, she was elected as a fellow of the American uh, Physical Society, um, which is really um, quite a big <coughs> distinction. So Catherine has a very unusually wide range of interests. It includes particle physics, the cosmological history of the universe, new theories of dark matter. Tonight, she's going to talk about how we know that dark matter exists and how we're searching for clues uh, as to its identity. So please join me in welcoming her. All right. Thanks, Tim, for the uh, kind introduction. <laughs> so um, I, I gave a rather playful title to this talk, The uh, Dark Matter Hunter's Guide to the Galaxy. Uh, but of course, what we're really going to do is to take uh, a, uh, um, a, a survey of the universe to understand just on the most basic level, how is it that we know dark matter exists? And what is it that we know about it? And uh, as many of you probably uh, got, <laughs> this is a reference to a favorite uh, famous book, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And uh, in this book, there's a, an advanced species that creates a supercomputer called Dietzad. And they ask the supercomputer the ultimate answer to the life, the universe, and everything. And the computer crunches, and it comes back with the answer 42. <laughs> And so uh, in response to the confusion about this answer, the computer says, well, you know, you need to ask a better posed question. <laughs> okay. uh, and in contrast to the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, understanding dark matter or understanding the observations uh, in, in, uh, is not going to give, in the universe, is not going to give us the answer to life, the universe, and everything. <laughs> but we are going to have a more meaningful and precise answer than 42. Okay, so we are going to ask well posed questions. So uh, when you look up on the sky, uh, you get the impression, especially if you go out uh, in Utah or someplace where there's really little city light contamination, and you can even see the Milky Way galaxy, what's what's shown here, you get the impression that astronomy and astrophysics is really the study of, uh, of light. It's all about the light that's, that's emanating to us from very distant places in the universe. But we also know that, that appearances can be deceiving. And I like to give this analog because I think it's quite uh, appropriate of the Copernican universe. So several hundred years ago, there was a Ptolemaic universe where uh, we were at the center, but they made observations of the planets around us. And in order to make a consistent picture of uh, the orbits of the planets, they required a more and more complicated model. I mean, they had this notion of physical laws that you should be able to explain through simple relations how things like the planets move on the sky. But in order to keep this notion that the Earth was at the center of it all, they had to add more and more uh, epicycles onto this basic picture about how the planets move. And the universe at the end of this looked very complicated. Now, once you made a shift in your paradigm, in your understanding of this, then everything comes in place. Okay? And that, that shift in paradigm was the idea that the sun should be at the center of our solar system. And then at that point, uh, all these planets just move around the sun. And we got a physical law, Newton's law, to govern these motions. And we didn't have to have all these epicycles. So the result was this a dramatic simplification of our understanding of how the solar system works, but at the price, if you want to call it a price, <laughs> that the Earth is not at the center of our solar system. So the situation that we have today is that our, our universe, our understanding of the cosmos, has only considered to, has only expanded outwards. And so here is a picture of our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, the disk of it. Looking from the top down, there's a black hole in the center of it. 
And the solar system sits out here about uh, 8 kiloparsec, or about 26,000 light years from the galactic center. And to give you uh, a scale, a light year is a long ways. <laughs> okay, it's 10 to the 15 meters. And we're sitting 26,000 light years from the center. Okay, so, um, so our galaxy is a, is a massive object. And even this, what we see in light, is not the total story. So now take this, we're looking down on the disk of our galaxy. And now ro imagine rotating it on the side. So here is the sun. So now we're looking at our disk of the galaxy here. We're whipping around the center of this galaxy about 250 kilometers per second. And actually, the, what we can see in stars is just a very par small part of this, the story. Uh, what we know, and, and what I, my aim is to explain, is that it's actually surrounded by a big, approximately spherical halo of dark matter. And we need this halo of dark matter here to explain all the observations that we see. And I'm going to go through what that is. Now, dark matter which is really important for the structure of our galaxy and really for the structure of the entire universe, also lives right here in this room. So we are in a solar system which is in our galaxy. And so the dark matter that permeates the galaxy also permeates this room. So we live in a dark matter fog. It's a fog that we can't see. But nevertheless, we know that there is some dark matter all around us. The density of this dark matter um, is in uh, units that are probably not very relevant for you, but it's about 0.1 GeV per centimeter cube, which corresponds to about one proton per every centimeter cubed. Okay. Now, by contrast, the density of ordinary matter is something like 10 to the 24 times higher. Okay. So the density of this table has on the order of 10 to the 24 protons per centimeter cubed. So what that tells you is that Earth is actually a very special place. It corresponds to an extremely abnormal part of the universe in the sense that there is a lot of ordinary matter. And by contrast, a relatively little amount of dark matter floating right through this room. However, if you look on much bigger scales, if you look in our galaxy, it's a different story. So this part of the pie chart is ordinary matter, and this part of the ch pie chart is dark matter. So it says that even though in this room, dark matter is extremely rare in comparison to ordinary matter, if I look over our galaxy, it's actually about the same amount. So dark matter is really important for the dynamics of our galaxies. And furthermore, what we also know is that whatever this is, it's not described by any theory that we know. That's the important point. So uh, physicists are, are uh, obsessed with details, really. They, they want to test their theories to ridiculous levels of precision. And unlike this part of the pie, where we've in some cases tested this to one part in a million, or even better than that, we really don't know anything about the underlying theory here. Okay, so this is what drives a huge number of people to think about how it is that we tease apart what that part of the pie is. Now, what do I mean more precisely by we can describe that left part of the pie? Well, it's known as the standard model of particle physics. And it's what the LHC is about and all the colliders that came before it. We tested to enormous precision the theory that describes atoms, which are made up of quarks, neutrinos, which are associated to the weak interactions, and then leptons, the lightest of which is the electron and sits inside of atoms. So we have a, a, a high precision understanding of what it is that goes into this part of the pie chart. By contrast, what sits on this other side of the pie chart is really kind of a big question mark. Okay? So it's one of the biggest open questions in science. We know as I'll explain, that it's critical for the formation and evolution of the universe, but we don't know how to describe it. We don't know what it is. It's as if we can uh, weigh it, we can weigh dark matter through our observations, but we don't know anything about the microscopic behavior of the theory. Okay. 
So there's been a paradigm shift that's happened very, very slowly over the last 80 years, okay? Because it takes a long time to bring physicists, or really anyone, around to this point of view. That there's a lot of stuff in the universe that, that we can't describe with any of our known theories. And so, um, similar to the Copernican revolution, this has been forced on us by observations. So the new viewpoint is that the dynamics of our universe are not dominated by ordinary matter. The most important component of it is dark matter. But once this piece is in introduced, it beautifully and extremely simply just makes all the pieces come together. And that really is the hallmark of a successful theory, that all of your observations from many different scales, as I'll explain, are accounted for this, by this one simple hypothesis. Okay, so dark matter dominates our universe, but we can't see it with our eyes. So I want to go through these two claims. The first claim is that dark matter dominates the structure in our universe. And I'll explain to you what I mean by structure. Gal our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, is an example of a structure. There are many, many galaxies in our universe. Okay? But I'll talk about how the um, existence of these structures provides evidence for dark matter. Then the second claim is that uh, Dark matter is not described by any known theory. So then the next question, after you've accepted that dark matter exists, is how is it that we identify what the dark matter is? In theorist parlance, that means how is it that we construct a theory of dark matter? Because ultimately, we want to get the same level of precision understanding of the dark matter that we currently have of ordinary matter. It's a very tall order uh, and something that we've been working on for decades now. So we're going to focus on what's going on in our universe. I'm going to tell you first, what is our universe? So have you ever asked yourself the question, what do you mean by the universe? Okay, it's not that at the edge of the universe, space-time just ends. What we mean by our universe is a very specific thing. It's all of space that could have communicated with us over the age of the universe. Okay. So, uh, so we know that the universe is about 13.8 billion years old. There's some error bar on it, but it's not very large. And we know from the special theory of relativity that nothing communicates at a speed faster than the speed of light. So what that tells us is that it's 13.8 billion light years in size. So now you can convert that to a regular distance by uh, figuring out how far light travels in a year using its speed, and the answer that comes out is that the size of our universe is 530,000 times the distance from us to the center of the galaxy, okay? So we said we're 26,000 light years from the center of the Milky Way galaxy, and the universe, which is the part of space-time that we can observe, is 530,000 times bigger than that. Okay, so you can imagine now how many Milky Way galaxies you can fit into a universe of that size. And that, in fact, is what we can observe. Okay, that's the remarkable thing, is we can measure all of those galaxies out on the sky and use them to learn about dark matter. So what gravity does for us is it allows us to weigh matter. That's almost all that gravity is good for, is weighing stuff. Okay. So there are two facts. There are two separate observations that we can make. So let's take a galaxy like the Milky Way galaxy. And the speed of stars in a galaxy uh, tells us about the enclosed mass. So this is a fact about uh, um, uh, Newton's law. So the, um, the faster, so uh, let's give you an analog with a, um, a playground. You know that when you're on a playground and you're on a, 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 um, a merry-go-round, something that's turning, the faster that thing turns, the more that a force, you can feel a force on you that has to pull you inwards. Okay? It's exactly the same thing here. We can observe how fast a star is moving around the center of the galaxy. And so therefore, we can infer 
from basic physics, from the same physics that holds you in on a merry-go-round, except here it's a gravitational force, how much mass should be there to hold the whole thing together? Okay, so that is one measurement that we can make. We can measure how fast these stars are whipping around and figure out, okay, how much gravitational force which is to say mass, has to be there to hold the whole thing together. That's pretty intuitive. Then we have a second completely independent measurement. And that is that we believe we understand how stars work. And we know, in fact, for a given mass of the star, how much light it should emit. And I can go and look at how much light there is, and therefore infer how much mass should be there. And the problem is, I have two different ways of measuring the mass, one from how fast the stars are moving, and the second from how much light there is. And they should give the same answer. If all of the mass is in the form of stars. But the problem is <laughs> that these two ways of measuring the mass don't give the same answer. Okay. So this, this, uh, this is a classic measurement. <laughs> goes back a long time. So this is Vera Rubin in the 60s making these measurements. And what she did was to go and look at stars. And as I explained, just as you're whipping around, the velocity depends on the amount of mass that you expect to be there to hold the whole thing together. And so this uh, bottom line is what one would infer from the amount of stars that are there. So you just measure the total amount of light, and this is what you would expect. From the distance to the center of the galaxy, you would expect a velocity of the stars that tracks this curve. But what we actually observe is something that looks more like curve B. And this is beautifully explained if there is an approximately spherical halo of dark matter Okay, we call it, it was just called dark matter because it wasn't in stars, therefore it wasn't luminous. That would have explained the discrepancy between these two curves. And that was all that was known about it actually for many decades. Now in the last uh, 20 to 30 years, we've gotten about a factor of 10 more evidence in very different kinds of systems, but they're all consistent remarkably with the amount of dark matter that you would infer from this observation. So let me explain those to you. So the most famous one is uh, clusters of galaxies. So um, Milky Way galaxy uh, um, uh, is, as I said before, a completely ordinary kind of galaxy. But galaxies like the Milky Way galaxy actually cluster into larger objects and not surprisingly, they're called clusters, okay? Clusters of galaxies. These are two clusters of galaxies. Similar to the Milky Way galaxy, they move, okay? So we have a typical velocity here within the Milky Way galaxy of 250 kilometers per second. These guys tend to move at velocities which are more like 1,000 kilometers per second. Now these clusters of galaxies are not unique. There's a lot of these in our universe, just because our universe is so big. Here's a picture of two of these coming together and colliding with each other. So what are these green contours? These green contours correspond to uh, uh, an effect which is known as gravitational lensing. So when light, we know from Einstein's theory of general relativity, when light sees mass, it bends. So we can measure the bending of light and then use that to infer where the mass is. And that's what these green contours are. So there's a lot of mass here, and there's a lot of mass here. And we infer that from the bending of light around these clusters of galaxies. The pretty colors here correspond to things that we can see in photons. So they actually correspond to gas that was in these clusters of galaxies actually being stripped off as these two galaxies pass by each other. So ordinary matter is actually very strongly interacting. And so when these two galaxies pass through each other, the gas actually got stripped off. And there was a pressure force that actually 
cause the shock wave to form. You can actually see it. That's one of the things that's really cool about this. The thing I want you to notice is that the center of mass of these two things is not where the ordinary matter is. This is telling you very visually that there's a lot of matter here that just doesn't appear to us in the form of photons. So this is one of the evidences for dark matter. And when these two clusters of galaxies pass through each other, it, just, it was almost as if they just didn't see each other. <laughs> they just passed right through. And that's because dark matter doesn't interact with itself very strongly. Another piece of evidence, what's known as the cosmic microwave background. The universe, uh, we said, was 13.8 billion years old. But we have this great gift of being able to look back at, at the way it looked when it was really young, around 370,000 years old. And we can look at it in photons. So that's what this is, is a very precise map of the sky, quite literally looking up at the sky, but not in stars, in something that's known as microwave radiation. These are very low energy photons that are coming to us. And we can look at little variations in the temperature of these photons. When I say little variations, they're one part in, uh, in 100,000 variations. So these are extremely small. You have to have a very sensitive instrument. Now, what is so fascinating about these one part in 100,000 variations? These are the things that cosmologists just live for. One part in 100,000 variations. Very rare things. Well, these little fluctuations are the seeds of all the structure in the universe. That includes our galaxy. Our galaxy grew out of one of these little fluctuations. So what this does is it tells you those one part in 10 to the 5 fluctuations, now you just wait and you let gravity act. Gravity tends to pull stuff together. And as it does that, eventually you get structure in our universe. So this is really a fossil record of the universe when it was 370,000 years old. And now we can take this map from the early universe and just apply gravity to it. Well, gravity plus a complex <laughs> simulation. So we can put those one part in uh, 10 to the 5 fluctuations on a computer and then apply general relativity. Or actually, you don't even need general relativity. You can use Newton's law. And then you let it run. And this is what happens as it runs. You can see those initial homogeneities just growing. So let's go back to that because it goes kind of quickly. So this is what you start from. You can see that it's very homogeneous. And now you just let the clock run. Clock plus gravity. Clock plus gravity will take those very small inhomogeneities that we saw in the previous slide, and it will just grow them. And this is what the computer simulation shows us. So now we can compare each one of these overdensities. Now I said these overdensities correspond to galaxies and clusters of galaxies. And I can compare it to what we see on the sky. So I can go and do a measurement. And that's, in fact, just what they do. So the Sloan Digital Sky Survey is uh, famous for having gone out and quite literally taking, taken a census of galaxies across the universe. Okay? And the result of doing this, taking what we see in the very early universe, putting it on a computer, evolving it with, uh, with ordinary Newtonian gravity, is uh, something that is consistent, perfectly consistent, with what we see from those rotation curves in our galaxy. So you can imagine how you would find this very compelling. You have a measurement from how fast stars move around the center of our galaxy. Then you have another measurement where you take these small fluctuations from when the universe was really young, and then you use a co computer simulation to evolve it forward, and then you compare it to galaxies in our universe, and they give the same answer. So this is what leads us to think, along with many other evidences, that uh, this picture is correct. That the amount of matter, which is ordinary matter, is small in comparison to the amount of matter for which we don't have a theory. 
So we can weigh dark matter. Okay, its weight, as I said, is about a proton per cubic centimeter. But of course, for scientists, we would like to be able to characterize it. We would like a theory, a mathematical theory, to describe it. So we'd like to. So just to give you some of the most basic things, we'd like to know what the mass of this particle is. Is there more than one? Uh, does it have some interactions, not with a photon, but with some other new forces that the dark matter may interact with? As I said, is there only one type of dark matter particle, or are there many? Are there dark forces? Do they form into structures like atoms? We don't have question, answers to any of these questions, and we'd like to understand what the underlying theory of dark matter is. So it's a little bit <laughs> like uh, taking a walk through a jungle, except you don't know what jungle you're entering. Okay? So you're, you are able to quite literally weigh the total amount of mass in the jungle, but you don't know anything more about its structure than that. So why is it so hard to learn about dark matter? Because after all, there is dark matter in this room, about 1 GeV per centimeter cube worth of it. The issue is that it rarely interacts with us, and everything that we have learned about dark matter is its aggregate properties on large scales. So we talked about these two clusters of galaxies colliding into each other. Well, the mass of one of those clusters of galaxies is something like 10 to the 14 times the mass of the sun. So these are really big objects. So we learn about the aggregate properties by weighing large objects and seeing how they respond to each other. If, by contrast, what you want to learn about is individual particles, you're not going to be able to learn about that by weighing them. The, the force is just too weak. And so what we need to do is to have other kinds of interactions of the dark matter with us in order to start to learn something about it. So, I don't know if you're a skeptic, if this sounds crazy to you. I don't know, fairy tale, that we go looking for dark things that we can measure in our universe that we say is in this room, but we don't have any direct uh, interaction with. And we have a very well-known example. So the sun that makes us warm and brings summer to us is a nuclear reactor. And uh, nuclear reactors, uh, uh, function off the weak interactions, and they produce neutrinos. So even ordinary nuclear reactors produce lots and lots of neutrinos. Uh, and the sun is no exception. So neutrinos from the sun, we have about 65 billion of them passing through each square centimeter in this room every second. So, th so they're copious. And yet, of course, we don't have any sense of these neutrinos around us. In fact, we have to build exquisitely sensitive detectors. So this is the Super Chemu Canada detector, which was a, a giant uh, volume of super pure water with surrounded by photomultiplier tubes. And here you can see it's down for maintenance. They have it half filled. And there's a little raft going around cleaning the photomultiplier tubes so that they can pick up the light that's produced when a neutrino, a very rare neutrino event, interacts with one of the uh, atoms in that water. Okay. So it requires even neutrinos, which we have a theory to describe, it requires pretty heroic efforts to detect them. And it's really no different for dark matter. And I like to make the analogy with mountain peaks, very appropriate here in Colorado. So uh, many of you, how many here have hiked to Buckskin Pass or any pass? Okay, yeah. So you know you start from Crater Lake, and you climb, you climb, you climb. And depending how well acclimatized you are, you might be thinking, this is too much work. But you keep climbing, you keep climbing, you keep going up the pass, up the pass, up the pass, and you see uh, what's on this side until you get up to the top. And as soon as you get up to the top, an entirely new vista opens up. So all of a sudden, at the top of Buckskin Pass, you'll see Snowmass Lake and Snowmass Mountain behind it. So here I gave a picture of the Torres del Paine. It's the exact same idea. It's the same thing with searching for dark matter. We are down here in the, uh, in the uh, Maroon Creek <laughs> Valley, okay? And we, in order to be able to go and explore dark matter, have got to push us up, ourselves up to some higher point so that we can see over into the next valley 
and try to detect what might be there. But it takes energy to do that. Okay, so this doesn't come easily, it doesn't come for free. And so we're living over here in one valley, and the dark matter is living over here in some other valley, and there's a barrier between it and us. Now we know that the dark matter interacts with us through gravity. Gravity is actually a very, very weak force, but we know that it, it communicates with one of us through one of these peaks, which is gravity. What we'd really like to do is to find a lower peak. We'd really like to find a lower pass that allows us to access the dark matter without taking quite so much energy. And because it doesn't take quite so much energy, we're going to be able to learn more about what the dark matter is. That's the picture. So concretely, what does that mean? We're looking for something really rare. That uh, pass right now, as far as we know it, is really pretty high. So we're looking for very rare interactions. And I'm going to talk about uh, kind of um, four different ways that you can look for uh, dark matter via uh, these mountain peaks. So dark matter could have very rare interactions with ordinary atoms. It could annihilate in our galaxy. Or, so these are rare processes. That's basically like tunneling through the mountain. Or we can also just scale the mountain. It's kind of the most brute force thing to do. So you can accelerate yourself to higher energies. That's what we do at a collider like the LHC. Or we could produce the dark matter in the laboratory at some lower energy, but with a very intense collider. So I'm going to explain to you a little bit more which each one of these things are, starting with the first one. So rare scattering of dark matter. So this is really analogous to neutrinos. We built these huge detectors uh, filled with very, very pure water with these photomultiplier tubes to look for the results of the interactions. It's a similar kind of idea looking for dark matter, but we don't know what the strength of the interaction is. So looking for rare events requires quiet detectors. And the reason for that is that we're actually bombarded by particle events all the time. So there are these things called cosmic rays. They come in from outer space and they hit our atmosphere all the time. And this would be a, a severe background to looking for these really quiet whispers of dark matter. So what do we do? We quite literally put these experiments into mines. We put them deep underground. So mines, as you know, are very dirty environments. So what do physicists do? They say, OK, we're going to make a clean room in a mine. And that is quite literally what is done. So for example, one of the places where this is done is the Sudan mine in uh, in northern Minnesota, there's another uh, mine in South Dakota, the Homestake Mine, which is uh, both of those mines are, are home to particle laboratories with clean rooms in them. And they house uh, these types of experiments uh, to shield them from co cosmic rays. They have to be very free from any radiogenic uh, backgrounds. And they have to be cold, otherwise thermal fluctuations uh, can also produce a background. Uh, so if you're wondering what they look like, as I said, they quite literally make a clean room underground. So this is the CDMS experiment. And they have some kind of a crystal. So this is a target. It's a semiconductor target in this case. And the idea is that the dark matter particle comes in and interacts with one of the particles, one of the ordinary atoms in this detector, very rarely. It, and it just deposits some heat. And you try to detect that heat. There are many different targets which are being tested in, and in R&D. So that there's a, um, a variety of different technologies that are complementary. They probe different dark matter interactions and masses. And there are theories of dark matter that help us know where to look. The second way we can look for dark matter is in our galaxy through a process known as dark matter annihilation. So dark matter, it turns out, uh, can uh, annihilate with itself, at least in some theories. So when it annihilates, it uh, produces standard model particles. And those standard model particles, then we can detect. Okay, we don't have any problems. So the dark matter itself is hard to detect. But the annihilation products are easy to detect. 
So it annihilates to electrons, protons, and photons, all of which we can detect with satellites. So where is it that you go and look for these kinds of processes? Well, dark matter is most likely to annihilate, of course, where there's the most of it. So do you have a guess of where there's the most dark matter uh, available to us? Any guesses? I guess I wrote it down here, so it's not. <laughs> so dark matter tends to sink because it's cold. So the highest density of dark matter is in the center of our galaxy. So here's a simulation of a galaxy. So if you were to look at it in terms of the annihilation rate, the place where it would be the brightest would be to, towards the center of the galaxy. And so then what you do is put up a telescope that uh, looks for, uh, for these annihilation byproducts. So one of these was the Fermi telescope, which measures high energy photons. So you might ask, well, what does this actually look like? What does dark matter look like in gamma rays? And it turns out that we've had some practice with this because there has been uh, a signal, a potential signal, floating around now for many years. Uh, so if you ask the question, what does dark matter look like in gamma rays, and how is it that you separate it from other astrophysical objects that produce similar kinds of photons? And the answer is very complicated. Okay, The answer really is it's complicated. So here is a picture from Fermi in very high energy photons. So here is the galactic plane. Okay, so this is what was shown before as those spiral arms. And uh, this is what it looks in high energy photons. And you can see that the highest intensity is actually towards the center of the galaxy. That's not surprising because there's a higher density of dark matter there, but there's also more stars there. So one of the question is, how do you distinguish high energy photons coming from dark matter annihilation from high energy photons coming from stars? And there are various tests you can do. Uh, here is what dark matter annihilation looks like. Here's what stars look like. And now you can try to distinguish between those two. Okay. And the answer is that you can apply quantitative models. But separating between those two is really hard. Okay? We actually had a few talks here at this workshop uh, about this ongoing debate about an excess in the galactic center that people think might be due to dark matter annihilation. So it's, it's, a, it's a hot and ongoing debate, which I'm not going to uh, delve in greater detail. The point that I want to make is that these observations are real, and people are thinking about ways that you can tease out a dark matter interpretation. So the third way you can search for dark matter is to uh, scale the mountain. Okay, so uh, dark matter can interact with us via very rare low energy interactions. Or you can just do the brute force way and say, okay, I'm going to climb up to the top of the peak and have a gander at what's on the other side. And that's really what we're trying to do in high energy colliders. So the LHC is the most famous one of these. So uh, the LHC, uh, which runs near Geneva, Switzerland, so there are the Alps. This is Lake Geneva here. And uh, this is the ring. So there's an underground tunnel. And in that underground tunnel, the accelerator uh, that uh, uh, produces protons with an energy equivalent to an aircraft carrier at five knots. It, it, they have to think about seasons when they actually run this collider because it, it really requires an enormous amount of energy <laughs> to feed this machine. And then uh, you uh, ram these particles together, which is the equivalent of pushing yourself up to the top of the mountain. And then you look at what comes out. And we have uh, exquisite and beautiful detectors for looking at what comes out when you crash two aircraft <laughs> carriers into each other. So um, here's a guy uh, doing maintenance. So this is when the detector is open, when the beam is not running. And it has a, a variety of different particle detectors. Uh, and uh, the idea is to characterize to an exquisite amount of detail what comes out of this process. Now, as you can imagine, protons are actually very complicated objects. It's like s people say it's like smashing trash cans together. And what comes out in this process, so here 
is a reconstruction of what happens in this detector during one of these events. So there's an interaction point here. And then, a, uh, so the beam line would be along here. There's an interaction point here. And then a bunch of stuff comes flying out. And from reconstructing all of these tracks, these tracks are individual particles or jets of particles, we try to understand what happened at this interaction point. So what does dark matter look at look like in, in a collider like this? Well, most of the time what comes back <laughs> is uh, ordinary standard model particles. And there are um, actually these plush toys that you can buy of all the standard model particles, okay? From the quarks to the uh, neutrinos to the leptons, including the um, electron, the forces, the photon, the gluon, the W and Z bosons. And then the thing that was discovered uh, a little more than five years ago now was the Higgs boson, which was the last missing piece in, uh, in the standard model particle physics. And it was discovered by uh, these very messy events. So you had an interaction point. And we created a Higgs in this process, which then decayed to two known force carriers. These are uh, force carriers of the weak interaction, the Z boson. And then those just decayed back down to electrons and a cousin of the electron known as the muon. And so these guys here are the muons. And then you get a couple of electrons. And we were able to reconstruct from these kinds of events that there was a new particle. So what does the Higgs have to do with dark matter? Well, we th actually think that the Higgs might be uh, a particle that could be one of these lower peaks that would allow us to see over to the dark matter sector. Okay, so it may, in fact, mediate interactions with us. And this is one of the things that we're looking for in these very precise underground detectors is very rare interactions with us that are mediated by the Higgs boson. So we can also not just push ourselves up to the top of this peak, the Higgs boson peak, but we can actually tunnel right through these peaks. This requires less energy, but also very intense beams. So it's a rare process to be able to tunnel through these peaks into the dark matter sector, but we think we might be able to do it. So how do you detect dark matter at a collider? So before, I was saying that we saw the Higgs boson by seeing two electrons and two muons. We didn't actually see the Higgs boson. We saw what it decayed into. So what does dark matter look like at a collider? It looks like uh, an unbalanced interaction. So that means that when uh, particles come in and they collide with each other, what comes out should have momentum and energy that's distributed equally around the interaction point. If I see in, say, electrons and muons, energy on one side, but then somewhere else I don't see any energy, the question is, what happened to this energy? We know that energy and momentum are conserved. So if an event, you know, you have this particle interaction here, if it looks lopsided, where I see standard model particles on one side, but then nothing on the other, that could be an indication that we're seeing dark matter in these particle uh, colliders. So all these methods of dark matter detection are different sides of the same coin. So scattering off of nuclei in these underground detectors, that was the first way that we talked about. Dark matter came in and inter interacted with a standard model. So this process here, dark matter in, dark matter out, standard model in, standard model out, that goes this, this direction, and that's direct detection in underground experiments. When dark matter annihilates here into standard model particles, protons, electrons, photons, that's an annihilation process, which is indirect detection. That was the Fermi satellite. And the last side of this is that I can throw two protons at each other, collide them, smash them together in an interaction point, and then maybe produce dark matter. 
and that's production at colliders. So all of these different ways of looking for dark matter are different sides of the same coin. And so putting all these things together, what we're really saying is that cosmic problems require multifaceted probes. So we started out by talking about how clusters of galaxies tell us that there's a lot of mass, which is not ordinary matter. Then we look at uh, the universe and its infancy, and we say, in order to get a universe that looks like ours, we need a lot of dark matter. And then we're putting together all of these different kinds of laboratory probes, from underground to indirect detection to colliding particles. All of these things are going to be necessary to try to answer the question of what's in this part of the pie. Now, the thing is, we're not guaranteed anything. Okay? This is a high risk, high reward type of endeavor. We don't know that dark matter has an interaction with us that's large enough to be detected in any one of these laboratory experiments. But the hope is, with a multifaceted, multi-pronged approach, that we will, through one of these methods, actually start to see a little bit of a hint. So I think it'll be an exciting time over the next decades, and we'll see what happens. So thanks. So I'll take some questions. Yes. Do you want to touch on that at all? Sure, absolutely. So um, let's go back to this slide. Can you repeat the question? So uh, he said that in the flyer there was a mention of something called asymmetric dark matter. And uh, the question was, can I explain what that is? So um, let's look at this part of the diagram. I said dark matter can annihilate. Uh, and when it annihilates, it produces standard model particles. So that is true if the dark matter is its own antiparticle. So uh, all of the standard model particles, so what do I mean antiparticle? All the standard model particles have an antiparticle. So there's an electron and a positron to go with it, and when those two get close to each other, they annihilate and produce photons. And every particle in the standard model has its own antiparticle required by the symmetries, uh, very basic symmetries. So um, when I say that dark matter can annihilate, what do I mean by that? Well, it turns out that uh, dark matter can actually be its own antiparticle. And uh, so there's no particle-antiparticle asymmetry in that particular theory. Now this is different than the standard model. In this room, we have electrons. No, no positrons floating around here. There's nothing here to annihilate our existence. There is an asymmetry between particle and antiparticle. So asymmetric dark matter just asks the very simple question, could there be a similar kind of asymmetry in the dark matter sector? More dark matter than anti-dark matter. And one of the reasons why you might expect that to be the case is that the total amount of dark matter in terms of its energy density is not very different from uh, the amount of normal matter, which has the similar particle-antiparticle asymmetry. And so you can have a mechanism where this asymmetry, which we know exists, is related to the energy density of the dark matter. And so there's some explanation for why these two might be on the same, same order of magnitude. In this theory, because now the dark matter is a particle and not an antiparticle, and it's not its own antiparticle, you often do not expect that there is a signal of this type, okay? Because dark matter is not its an own, own antiparticle, okay? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, if we don't know what dark matter is, how do you know when dark matter annihilates that it annihilates in the standard model particle? So we don't. So uh, this is based on a theory uh, called the weakly interacting massive particle paradigm, uh, where the dark matter density, what, which we observed in the universe, is actually related to the standard model forces. It turns out that when you do that, 
you can actually do a calculation that allows you to predict how much dark matter there should be in the universe today. And when you do that calculation, it turns out that the answer that you get is pretty close to what we observe. So one of the ideas for dark matter is that uh, it has interactions with standard model forces, the weak forces to be particular. And so if it has interactions with the weak forces, then the weak forces will interact, will mediate an, uh, an annihilation process between the dark matter and the st standard model. Now this is a hypothesis. <laughs> it's a hypothesis that we're testing. Uh, you know, there are th these hints from the Fermi satellite. They're tantalizing. People don't know what to make of them. Uh, I think we'll be able to either confirm that hypothesis eventually or else rule it out. But we don't know. <laughs> it's a hypothesis that we're testing. It could be the case that dark matter annihilates, but it's only into particles in its own valley. You know? uh, and then what you really hope is that eventually those particles that it produced in its own valley decay back into our valley. They tunnel and eventually produce ordinary particles that we can see. But that's what, one of the reasons why I say it's a high risk, high reward uh, endeavor because nothing that you do is guaranteed. We have ideas based on self-consistency, based on what we observe in the universe, but we're testing a lot of different hypotheses and trying to narrow down which one it might be, if it's any of them. Yeah. I'm having difficulty with one of the charts when you show the pie chart. Yes. Can you go back to that for a moment? Typically, the way here, at least, we've seen this type of chart is where it says 5% is matter. And I would think that would be atoms. Uh, about 25% is dark matter. And then it gets into the dark energy. Right. Which is, so the dark energy part has been pulled out of this. Yes, correct. However, you talked about the dark matter, talking about the energy of it a moment ago. Right. So I'm a little confused. This is a subset of the matter energy. Yes. So I did not talk about quote unquote dark energy. So dark energy is actually uh, dominant to dark matter by about a factor of three in its total energy density. And the reason why I didn't talk about dark energy is because we don't know whether there's dynamics there. So what do I mean by we don't know if there's dynamics? I know that uh, I can write down a theory for any of these particles here, including dark matter, and uh, it has uh, new interactions. There are masses associated with the particles, potentially new forces, all of the things that I use to typically characterize the standard model will also be a feature of the dark matter sector. Dark energy has been given that moniker but it may just be a fundamental constant of nature, like you know, uh, alpha electromagnetic or the value of Newton's constant. It could just be uh, a fundamental constant of nature that has an interpretation as an energy density. And the reason why it has an interpretation as an energy density is because it causes the universe to expand in a certain way. So I didn't talk about dark energy because we don't know <laughs> that there are new dynamics to uncover there. It could just as be, as I said, a fundamental constant of nature. Now, we don't know that's true either, but whatever that is, it doesn't belong to the realm of matter, which is uh, gonna be describable by, uh, by, uh, by a Lagrangian, okay, to use technical term, and ordinary particle interactions. Is a photon matter then? A photon, so matter and energy, we know by <coughs> Newton's or by Einstein, you know, are, are, are the same. Yes. Yeah. So uh, it's a form of relativistic matter is, is what we would use to say that. Go ahead. Is the distribution of dark matter in the universe follow the distribution of luminous matter? So uh, in some cases, yes. In some cases, no. So going back to this picture that I showed very early on, if we look at our own galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, the answer is not really. So uh, most of the stellar, um, 
uh, ordinary matter collapses down to a disk. And the reason for that is that there's a massless photon. So it's the configuration. So you can lose energy by always radiating photons. So the configuration that allows you to lose energy while conserving angular momentum is a disk. So that's what we form from ordinary matter. The dark matter doesn't have that same photon interaction. So it stays relatively spherical. Well, if there's dark matter, then that a lot of it is not associated with luminous matter. Could you look for dark matter annihilations in areas where there's relatively little luminous matter and get rid of all the junk that you see at the yes. center of the galaxy? Mm -hmm. Yes. So in fact, one of the places you can look, so you can see these things here, are actually little dwarf galaxies. And um, those, they're not completely dark. They have some stars, but they have a lot fewer stars than there is in the galactic center. Now, the only downside to looking in those, so it is true there's a lot less light contamination. But on the other hand, there's all, the density of dark matter in these objects is much lower. And so therefore, the annihilation rate is lower. So people also do look in these dwarf galaxies. And they're not quite as strong as what we're seeing. The constraints that you can get from looking at these dwarf galaxies are not quite as strong as what you can get by looking at the galactic center. So yes, people certainly do try to do that. But uh, it's not a game that we're winning quite yet. And would a neutron star attract enough dark matter that you could look for annihilations there? So neutron stars do attract dark matter if they interact at all with normal matter. Uh, and depending on the kind of dark matter, yes, you can have annihilations that happen. And if you accumulate enough dark matter, it can actually change the properties of the neutron star. Um, so in some cases, you can actually get uh, constraints on very strong interactions with neutron stars. But it's not a generic feature. So typically, those constraints are not stronger than what we can get from interactions in ordinary laboratory experiments just because it's a much more precise measurement. Thank you. Yeah. How do black holes affect clustering? So they're very important. So we have a black hole in the center of our galaxy. And it will affect the way that dark matter clusters very close to the black hole. And in fact, that's not well understood. But the thing is that the scales at which you expect that black hole to affect the, um, the density of dark matter is a very small radius. So what we try to do is to go just a little ways away from that black hole so that, we, so that our theories <laughs> can predict well the dark matter density. And it's still an open question that people are trying to understand is what's the interplay between the black hole, uh, between the stellar matter there, the ordinary matter, and the, and the dark matter there. So it's certainly an open question. So in order to get eaten up by the black hole at the center of our galaxy, it has to sink sufficiently. So the reason why we don't all collapse to the center of our galaxy is just like when you're on the uh, uh, turntable, we're moving. <laughs> we have a kinetic energy. And so therefore, that balances the pull of the gravitational energy towards the center of the galaxy. So, um, so actually, one of the questions uh, that's an open question, is how is it that that black hole at the center of our galaxy got so big? <laughs> we're, we're not really sure. Um, and so it's that we actually have the opposite problem, <laughs> that, uh, that we don't understand how, that, uh, how um, black holes of the mass that we see in the center of our galaxy are formed efficiently enough. Just because there's enough kinetic energy, you know, when things form gravitationally, when they bind together, uh, when you fall in towards the center of something, you get a kinetic energy. And that kinetic energy stays. And so you tend to, um, it, it's self-supporting in that sense. We call it, there's a technical term for it called virialized. And so that's the reason why this whole thing doesn't collapse, is because there's a kinetic energy associated with the, the particles that are moving around the galactic center. Yeah. 
by yes. what? By gravity, but also by a whole collection of black holes themselves and these super... So the black holes are not very important. Uh, they're a very small fraction of the total amount of energy density in the universe. So they're not very important for the, how we see structure forming and evolving. So what's really happening in our universe is we uh, know that from the Big Bang, we produced an enormous amount of radiation. Radiation that has pressure. It tends to blow things apart. And uh, that is balanced against the fact that matter, cold matter, tends to pull things together. And so the way the universe expands is this balance between the radiation pushing things out and the matter pulling things back together. Now there are equations that describe that, and we solve those equations, but that's the basic physics. So the second part of the question is, you mentioned <coughs> in this map that that's as far as we can observe. Mm -hmm. We don't know. The answer is we don't know. No, it's is what we can observe itself a structure? So uh, I'm not sure what you mean by that. So uh, <coughs> what we observe is described by mathematical <coughs> equations. You know, there's an Ein essentially Einstein's equations. There's a metric, there's matter, there's radiation. We can solve those equations, understand how it expands and changes as a function of time, and then we can compare that against uh, the equations. So we, or the, we, we take the equations and we compare them against the observations. And those match each other exquisitely well. So we have a very consistent picture. So if you ask me what's outside of our universe, what's outside of what we observe, um, that's right now a metaphysical question. Uh, it's, it's not one uh, that we're able to test. <laughs> Uh, through observations. That said, people still ask this question. Okay? In string theory, it's famous for an ever-increasing number of vacua. <laughs> and people talk all the time about tunneling from one universe to the other, and how is it that we could have you know, populated a universe that looks like ours. Um, it, it's hard to see how we're going to get from those ideas to concrete tests. Okay? Um, uh, unless we happen to get lucky and there's something that we see on the largest scales that would be indicative of what might be happening just outside. But we don't have uh, very concrete tests right now, which is why I say it's a metaphysical question. All right, so we'll conclude there. Uh, thanks all for coming. If you have any other questions, I'm happy to answer them afterwards.